Okay, this is uh, for my third hour class on the 13th of February. Okay, um, we're talking about the women's movement. And uh, I suppose if I had to pick one person in the women's movement who was the most significant, it would be Susan B. Anthony. Uh, but there were a lot of people involved in this. And women clearly were second-class citizens. They couldn't make their own decisions. They certainly couldn't vote. They couldn't run for office. And uh, people like uh, uh, Carrie Chapman Catt and um, uh, Alice Paul, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, I gave you all those names the other day, didn't I? Did I give you those names? You gave yeah. us Susan B. Anthony. Well, write these women down, too. Because uh, if you ever encounter them, you should all you automatically relate them to the women's movement. And by the way, many of them never marry. They devote their entire lives to women's suffrage, and they're pretty long lived. Okay, they they live to to the, their nineties. Okay, uh, I can't say that about all of them, but a, a good number of them did, and they dedicated their entire life to women's suffrage. And all all Americans owe a debt to these women. All Americans owe a debt to these women. Uh, but especially American women, because uh, you could, you would not be able to participate uh, and do a lot of other things uh, if you did not, if, if it were not for the efforts of these women. And, and again, they gave their lives to this. Carrie Chapman Cat. And uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton all suffragettes, that's what they call Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Suffragettes, that's what they call women who fought for the right of uh, women to vote. And their colors, by the way, were just for the record, were blue and gold. And these women, along with uh, others, formed the National Women's Suffrage Movement, the National Women's Suffrage Movement. Um, and, of course, there were some women who were uh, very uh, flamboyant, uh, to put it mildly. There's, a, there's Carrie Chapman Cat holding an American flag. You can never be a citizen until you have the right to vote. There are some suffragettes out in front of the White House when Woodrow Wilson was president, February of 1917, just a few months before women get the right to vote. Mr. President, how much, how long must women wait for liberty? Mr. President, what will you do for women's suffrage, picketing out in front of the White House? And some of these women, you know, chained themselves to the gates of the White House. Some of them chained themselves to trees. People literally died. <coughs> you know, people literally died for the right of women to vote. You know, I often say, you know, in Australia, if you don't vote, you'll get a, after election, you'll get a little note from the government saying that you owe a certain fine. They fine people for not voting. And of course, I'm a great advocate of voting, and uh, people think that I would be for something like that. I would not. You have the right to vote, and you certainly have the right, if you don't want to cast a vote for the rest of your life, you have the right not to vote. But that being said, I don't understand why anyone wouldn't vote, but especially women and African Americans. When you see what it took for them to get the right to vote, when you see what people literally died for, for those uh women and African-Americans to have the right to vote. And if an African-American doesn't want to vote, that's his or her business. I don't understand it. Or if a woman doesn't, I don't understand that. Uh, but they certainly have the right not to vote. But I really can't, I, I have to say that they probably don't know the history of what it took for them to get the right to vote. I have this optimistic faith that if they did, uh, they, they would vote, okay? Uh, there's a woman, help us win the vote. And then there's a group of men standing around looking at this radical woman out here wanting the right to vote. Uh, of course, there's the National Association opposed to women's suffrage. And there are a group of men, I guess, looking down. Well, they've got their literature taped up on the wind and they're reading why women should never be given the right to vote. And of course, there's a woman kind of going by uh, looking askance at that group of men. There's a cartoon that's an anti-woman suffrage cartoon, you know. Gender is a great issue today uh, in our culture. Well, guess what it was then too, because the whole point of this cartoon is, is if, if women, you know, women, many people believe had the most sacred job in history and that was to raise uh, the, the coming generation. 
Uh, their job was to uh, raise the next generation and instill into them American values. But if a woman, they said, ever got the right to vote, uh, it would literally uh, turn the gender roles upside down. There's a woman getting ready. She's got her uh, papers under her arms and she's, you know, dressed all except for the dress like a man would. She's got her umbrella over her arm and she's leaving. And there's the man looking very worried. He's being left at home. Uh, to carry out the traditional role of the woman. And he's got two crying children. The cat's scared to death of her. Uh, she's no longer a woman. I mean, they they essentially said in a lot of these anti-suffrage, uh, uh, at, at, a, at a lot of these anti-suffrage rallies that giving women the right to vote would unsex them. In other words, they would no longer be real women. They would be taking on the role of men. Uh, and it would literally destroy uh, the culture. And of course, there's that's entitled election day. If women ever get the right to vote, uh, women will no longer be women and men will no longer be men. You know, politics was considered to be a dirty, greasy, sleazy uh, profession. And so you leave that kind of stuff to the men. And while the women here, you know, they're pure uh, and they are uh, running the home and they are raising the next generation of Americans they don't need to soil themselves, dirty themselves with this politics. Leave that to men. Uh, that was the attitude. I guess the argument. I guess the argument was, if women ever got the right to vote, they would be as bad as men. Maybe that's the argument that they had. But anyway, uh, you can see that played out here in this cartoon. This woman is the first woman to ever run for president. Got that down. Her name was Victoria Woodhull. She ran on the Equal Rights party, third party, didn't have a chance, but she, she wasn't running to win. She was running to make a point. And she's a very beautiful woman. Uh, and, uh, you know, she shocked the country by saying that she was a free lover. She's running on the free love ticket as well. She attacked the idea that she said marriage was an outdated institution. Why get married? She wanted to reform the divorce laws. She said all this stuff of making people stay together, quote, till death do us part. Here was her answer to that. And I quote, she said, I am a free lover. I have the unalienable, excuse me, I have the inalienable constitutional natural right to love who I may, to love for as long or as short a period as I can, to change my lover every day if I please, end quote. Now, if a woman was out running or anybody was out running for president today, in the 21st century, and they made a statement like that, would that be a shocking statement today? You think, I think it would. I think if, you know, I think if somebody said, I want to be the president of the United States and I have the right to change who I cohabitate with, I have the right to change my lever every day if I want to. And by the way, I just want to say this to all you married people, marriage is an outdated institution. We ought to just throw it in the ash heap fishery. You don't think that would cause controversy today? She was running for president at all. I think running for county commissioner, it probably would. Yeah, I think that would be a very controversial statement today. Well, you can imagine what it was like in the 1880s when she ran for president. She also, and she lost, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, like I say, she, she wasn't running to win. She was running to make a point. She couldn't even vote for herself. Who was her vice presidential candidate? This also shocked Americans in the 1880s. Who was her vice presidential candidate? That's just a, such a broad, open-ended question. You know, famous for civil rights. Frederick Douglass. Excellent. Yeah. Frederick Douglass, the first African-American ever nominated by a major party to be vice president of the United States. And today, of course, we have an African-American, Asian, uh, who is the um, vice president of the United States. What is her name? Kamala Harris. Harris. That's true. So, again, the country's made a lot of progress. This woman ran for uh, vice president when John McCain ran against Barack Obama in 2008. She was the former governor of Alaska. People thought she was really rather attractive. Who is that? Sarah Palin. Hmm? Sarah, Sarah Palin. Thank you. I'd forgotten for a minute. I had one of those senior moments. I couldn't remember who she was. I voted for her. But Sarah Palin, okay? She didn't win, but she's a vice presidential candidate. Of course, who's that? And that's Mrs. Clinton, you know, who me and uh, half, more than half the country thought was going to win, and she didn't. But she, uh, you know, was often called the first woman ever nominated for uh, president in the country, and it wasn't. Uh, it was uh, 
her, Victoria Woodhull. Okay, whoops, now the Victoria's going away. I don't know what happened here. Uh, okay. Okay. There, she's back. <laughs> so, anyway, Mrs. Clinton was. We're going to elect a woman. It's not going to be very long. And, you know, in the 21st century, I, I talked to people who said, I, I had a neighbor, a great guy, but he said, I'm not voting for her. It's not a This is in the 21st century. It's not a woman's place to be president. It's not a woman's place to be president. Uh, and by the way, they just hated Hillary Clinton. Oh, they were scared to death of her. I voted for her, you know. And I think she'd have made a pretty good president. That's just my opinion. I don't think we'll ever know. There's Vice President Harris. Okay. We've already had, we've always had first ladies. And now that uh, Mrs. Harris is uh, the vice president, we have the first gentleman. Okay. Her husband is the first, is called the first gentleman. Okay. Um, well, get this down. In 1910, by 1910, women had the right to vote in 10 states. They could only vote in, listen, they couldn't vote for president. They could only vote in state elections. They could vote for the governor of Ohio. By the way, which state was the first state to allow women to vote in state elections? Kansas. Kansas, no. California. No. That's a good guess. That's that, if I didn't know, I, that's what I would have said. Wyoming. Why? Why do you have to write that down? Why did Wyoming? Why do you reckon Wyoming became the first state to let women vote in any sort of election? They had the least amount. Of By the way, that was in. I think that was in. Yeah, eighteen sixty nine. Women don't get to vote in this country until nineteen twenty. Wyoming is eighteen sixty nine. 1869, the Indian Wars are going on. That's the wild and woolly West. People didn't want to go out there, and those settlers were desperate for female companionship. So they said, if we let women vote, maybe some women will come out here. I don't know how that worked out, but they let women vote in state and local elections. In 1919, get this down, this is a lot of 19s, but in 1919, the 19th Amendment was added to the Constitution. And the first time that women voted in a presidential election was in 1920, the presidential election of 1920. We just had the election of 2020. That was the, and they didn't say much about this. Uh, and that's a shame, but it was the, this the past presidential election was the 100th anniversary of women being able to vote. Out of 234 years of national history, we've been a country for about 236, seven years, uh, women have voted for 100 less than half of that time. And by the way, it took it took a 75 year struggle for women to get the right uh, for women to get the right to vote. So it's a huge thing. And like I say, we're about to elect our first woman president. I don't know who it Nikki Haley, I could happily vote for her. I would be glad to vote be voting back in, since I'm a Republican. I would be glad to be voting back in the Republican column again. She has announced that she's running for president and she's running for the Republican nomination against Donald Trump so far. There'll probably be 500 other Republicans, you know, join the fray. And at the end of that, Donald Trump will be the nominee of the party. You know, Donald Trump never got more than 34% of the Republican vote in the primary races. You understand that. But there were so many Republicans running that 34% was the majority that he needed. Okay, that's probably what's going to happen again. I hope not. Anyway, uh, women also get this down uh, in addition to fighting for the right to vote. Women were also strong in the progressive movement. Uh, and in many instances, women led reform movements. And I want to talk about the reformers starting with this woman on the board, Jane Adams. <coughs> Saint Jane, as she is called, Saint Jane. She lived from 1860 to 1935. She was a socialist. She was a social worker. She went into some of the worst family situations you could imagine uh, and tried to sort them out. She was a pacifist. What does that mean? What's a pacifist? A pacifist is someone who's opposed to all war, and I mean all war. 
Well, I'm against war unless you're attacked. She was against all war. She was an advocate and a member of the world peace movement. She worked to outlaw war in the world. She was very, very wealthy. Her father, she was born in Chicago. Her father was a wealthy man. Uh, and when uh, he died, his, his, his wife died before him. And when he died, she inherited, and it was quite a fortune. She could have lived a life of luxury uh, all of her life. But when he died, she inherited his entire fortune. But instead of just spending it on herself, I mean, she could have toured the world on great ocean liners for the rest of her life and then waited on hand and foot. Uh, but what she did is that she, she had this uh, passion, get this down, this, she never married, uh, she had this passion for the poor, especially the immigrant poor. And so she started using that fortune to build houses in the major cities where the populace were pouring in. Where the populace, where the, <laughs> it's going to take me a while to get off the populace, where the immigrants were pouring in, okay? And she named those houses whole houses. And for all I know, I need to check this, but for all I know, the whole houses may still be around. But that's one of the first ones she built right there, whole house in Chicago, okay? Whole house in Chicago. Get this down. She took in immigrants right off the boat or the train in Chicago. She taught them English. She didn't do it or so. Well, she might She might have, but she had a hired staff to teach them English. She brought in carpenters and others and paid them to teach these people job skills. And she also taught them about democracy. This is the way, if you're going to prosper in this country, you need to know how this government works. You need to know what the rule book says. That was her, one of her major missions. Uh, and she said, you're never, you know, you're never going to, pro she helped people become citizens, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Uh, because mothers and fathers and older children had to work every day. She opened, she was ahead of her time. She's going to open daycare centers for these working immigrant mothers. We're still, by the way, one of the things that the uh, women's movement today is trying to establish in companies uh, like Texas Instruments and others, Microsoft, and maybe those two companies that I just named already have this, but they want childcare for their children. Uh, I think we talked about that the other day, didn't we? Yeah, you know, you know, I want to bring little Junior and drop him off. Uh, downstairs and I'm going to go up to the 40th floor and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to work. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's an issue today. Well, she was a woman ahead of her time. Okay. Uh, and of course she taught these children uh, to read and write. Uh, and also she did, she sponsored summer camps because these children, many of them lived in the most horrid slums that you can imagine. And to get them out of the crowded slums for just a few weeks, uh, in the city, she had these summer camps out in the country where they uh, could go. So uh, uh, Jane Adams, St. Jane, write this woman down, Claire Barton. These are all progressive women. Uh, Claire Barton. She was called, you know, during the Civil War, she was called the angel of the battlefield. Get that down, the angel of the battlefield, Claire Barton. She and other women, get this down, when the war was over, they took the lead in, in America's drug war. And we had a drug war, just like we have today. What was the abused drug? What's the abuse? What's killing 90, 90 Americans a, a day? There are 90 people that were alive last night at midnight, and they'll be at the morgue tonight at midnight. Meth. Huh? No, nope, it's not meth. It's meth's cousin. What? Fentanyl. Yeah, opioids, right? Laced with fentanyl. Yeah. Yeah, 90 people a day, 100,000 Americans die per year. We just seem to be pretty much okay with that. I wonder what if, if, if Al-Qaeda was killing 90 Americans a day, what the attitude of this country would be. We would probably be up in arms. Anyway, what was the most abused drug of the Gilded Age and the most abused drug in history? Nope, not the Gilded Age. As bad as opioids are, they've never matched this one I'm talking about. It's the biggest killer. It's the destroyer of homes, families, people. Alcohol. Alcohol, write that down. By the way, what have we done with the most destructive drug in history? Legalized it. Huh? Legalized it. We legalized it, and you know what we do? We sell it everywhere. It's everywhere. We sell it 
tax it, and I don't know, build roads with it. The most destructive drug in history. You think if somebody, if you think somebody got up, some congressman got up and said, I think we ought to legalize fentanyl and sell it. You can buy whatever you want after you're 21. You think that would fly? No, but that's what we've done with the most destructive drug in history. Anyway, uh, get this down. So alcohol was the most abused drug, and the war against alcohol began actually in the 1820s. The war on alcohol began actually in the 1820s. Now, again, you got to kind of keep some sort of timeline in your mind. We're in the 1880s, approaching the 20th century now, but back uh, in the 1820s, okay? And, of course, in the 1820s, the movement was called the temperance movement, okay? Write that down. They didn't want to do away with alcohol, the temperance movement. They said, we said, hey, we just want you to moderate your drinking. Okay, we want you to moderate your drinking. I mean, drinking was a real problem in the United States in the 1820s. Foreign countries referred to us as the alcoholic republic. I mean, your work day pretty much went like this. You got up in the morning, you didn't drink coffee, you drank a dram, a shot of whiskey. And then about the middle of the morning, you drank, the work crew would stop and you'd drink a couple of more. And then when it was lunch, you'd walk over to the saloon, you'd have a few drinks while you're reading. Are you okay over there with your eyes shut? You all right? Yeah, well, keep them open if you're going to stay in here. Now, you can go out in the hall if you want to. Why don't you go sit in my chair down there and you can just have a real snoozola, okay? You want to do that? Okay, well, good. I'm going to start giving you your options. Only one other I know of. That's the office. That's where you're heading, by the way. But anyway, we'll get there. Anyway, back to what I was saying. You'd go to the local tavern. You'd eat a sandwich and you know, drink, help drink a gallon of beer, and then you'd go back to work in the afternoon, you know, about the middle of the afternoon, you'd take another drink of whiskey, and on the way home from work, you'd have two or three whiskeys, and then you got home, and you had a few pre-dinner drinks, and by that time, you're just a slob drunk, <coughs> and, uh, you know, just before night, you went to bed, you'd have a nightcap. That was the regular routine of thousands of Americans, okay? This country, to a large extent, was staggering drunk. That's why foreign countries called it the alcoholic, the alcoholic republic. Well, the temperance movement said, by the way, Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, when he was a young man, even went to a temperance rally and he signed, get this down, he signed the pledge. When they'd have speakers get up and talk about how alcohol was destroying America. And at the end, they'd say, come down and sign the pledge. And Lincoln did. He swore not to drink. And he didn't drink again. Uh... So that, you know, but they didn't want to outlaw alcohol. They just said drink responsibly, okay? If you watched the Super Bowl yesterday, there probably was some kind of beer commercial at the end of it. They said drink responsibly. Did that happen? I didn't watch it. Well, I watched a little bit of it. Did that happen? Drink responsibly? Well, anyway, that's what temperance was all about. Get this down. But by the Gilded Age, the 1880s, the temperance movement, the temperance movement had uh, blown into the uh, prohibition movement. I don't think I have to tell you what that is, but in case I do, the root word is prohibit. By 1880, thousands and tens of thousands of mainly women were working to outlaw alcohol. You know, uh, they called it the women's crusade. These are evangelical. These are devoutly Christian women. They launched the women's crusade. Led by people, I don't have her picture, but uh, write this woman down, Frances Willard. Okay, Frances Willard. Willard. Okay, and she established, get this down, she, and there was one of these in Tulsa at one time. She established uh, an, uh, uh, Frances Willard Homes, where battered wives, beaten up by their alcoholic husbands, or abused and hungry children, or prostitutes could come and live and get their lives back in order at the Francis Willard homes. That's a big deal. She also is the leader in a movement that is called the WCTU. WCTU, that's the women's, and all this down, Christian, the women's, Christian, temperance, <laughs> temperance union, the WCTU. She was active in that. And they had, I think, at one time, now to show you how this thing spreads, the WCTU, by the way, they also they shut down bars. They fought against 
cigarettes. Cigarettes were just coming online. Up until this point, it had always been cigars. Cigarettes, cigarettes, a mild version of the cigar, they were saying. Uh, they fought against uh, cigarettes. They um, also um, fought against cocaine. Uh, Coca-Cola, a, a new soft drink comes out in the 1880s. I think a dentist in Atlanta produced that. Maybe it wasn't a dentist, but anyway, in the 1880s, it starts in Atlanta, Coca-Cola. The reason they call Coca-Cola there because they got cocaine in it. And, if you're, and it was just perfectly legal. And if you're walking down the street at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you've been working all day, and you're well, you know, yourself dragging a little bit, you can just go in the drugstore and say, give me a Coca-Cola. And they'd give you that, and you'd take that, and boom, bam, pep you right up. And you could go on and finish the work day. Well, Frances Willard and her uh, associates fought against cocaine-laced Coca-Cola, and they won on that one. They wore white ribbons. The WCTU, you could tell them, and like I say, there were 200,000 of them. <coughs> of course, perhaps the most colorful of the, uh, get this woman down, the most colorful of the, uh, anti-saloon, anti-drinking people was this woman, Carrie Nations, okay? Carrie Nations. You can see she covered herself from head to toe in solid black. Uh, you can see her two weapons there. In one hand, she's got a Bible. In the other hand, she's got a hatchet, just like you split kindling with at home. Uh, and she said, you know... <laughs> These other women, they would go to a saloon, they'd kneel down in front of it and start singing hymns and praying and just singing hymns and praying. And they'd come back every day and do that. Terry Nation said, that'll never work. We'll be, we'll wear our knees out and we'll be here forever waiting on a prohibition to take place. She said, you've got to shut these saloons down, get this down. So she would arrive in a town alone, usually in a buggy. She would park her buggy in front of the Biggest saloon on Main Street. I think she did this in Stillwater. I know she lived in Oklahoma. By 1905, she was living in Oklahoma. I don't know how long, but I think she, and she said that she would conduct a hatchetation. Write that down. A hatchetation. Put it in quotes. Carry Nation. And what that was, she would walk into the bar with a hatchet, and she would start chopping up the bar and smashing bottles break the mirrors and she would chase away the patrons at the bar who were drinking. <clears throat> and she did that all over Kansas and Missouri and Oklahoma. She, and she got followers and she called her followers, the home defenders. She called her followers. Thank you. She called her followers, the home defenders. And before it was over hundreds of women, were marching uh, on bars to close them down across the nation. She was put in jail 32 times, okay, 32 times for destruction destruction of property. But like I say, she's probably the most colorful prohibitionist in America uh, in uh, during, during the Gilded Age. All these people, all of these women that I've talked about, and get this down, all of these women that I've talked about and many more that I have not, talked about uh, were progressives. They're all progressives. Uh, they were all humanitarians. That's what a progressive is, humanitarian. A humanitarian is someone who is concerned, humanitarians, with the conditions of their fellow, the conditions of their fellow humans, the conditions of their fellow humans. They and they believed that the government, get this down, they believed that the government had to be, and I quote, an agent of reform. In other words, they believed we can march and we can pray and we can sign petitions and we can smash up saloons. But until the government, and not just in, in prohibition, the government should be involved in all these reform movements until the government gets involved, until the government feeds the hungry, uh, until the government saves the alcoholic, until the government educates the ignorant, until the government houses the homeless, um, none of our goals are going to be accomplished. We may work and we will support the government, but, but the government must play a role in the lives of people. You see that theme again and again and again in the middle of this age of rugged individualism. 
And of course, what event or which event is going to convince the majority of Americans that government has a role to play in their lives? Huh? No. Nope. What'd you say? The Great Depression in the 1930s. That's when government enters into the lives of the American people in a major way that it had never before, and it has never left. It has never left. Today, when people are overwhelmed with circumstances, we don't say just work harder. We say there are government programs to help you, and I'm talking about being overwhelmed by major circumstances. Anyway, um, these progressives believe that with government help, get this down, with government help, human beings can be perfected. Just pass enough laws and the human race can be perfected. Is that true? No. We don't think that. Can you legislate morality? Can you, you know what I mean by that? Can you pass laws, enough laws to make people behave themselves? No. You can't. Can you? You can't. Can you? What a cynical group. You're too cynical to be, uh, but you're right. What I think, I agree with you. What's a perfect example of that? Passing laws. To improve the behavior of people and it just flatly hasn't worked. Prohibition. Huh? Prohibition. Prohibition didn't, but we don't even, we don't have to go back to prohibition. You're exactly right. We don't have to go back to prohibition. What's going on right now today that laws have been passed? Abortion. Huh? Abortion. <laughs> well, you know, um, I see your point that some people would say, well, you know, there's nothing wrong with abortion. And some people would say, yeah, but yeah, they, they pass laws. The court has ruled that uh, abortion is no longer a constitutional right. It's up to the states and the state of Oklahoma has passed laws, uh, if I read what you're saying right, we've passed laws that abortion's illegal in Oklahoma, but are there still abortions going on in Oklahoma? Yes. Yes, yes. yes. But I'm thinking of something else. What's another example right now in the, the state of Oklahoma, or the United States of America, we pass law after law after law, and the problem just gets worse. Drinking and driving. What? Drinking and driving. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, you're right. You're you're exactly right. You haven't said a word wrong. Underage drinking. Underage drinking. Can you think of anything else? Drugs. 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 Which drug? The marijuana. Marijuana. How many people have been killed lately from marijuana? I don't know. <laughs> I don't think any, but now I may be wrong. What was that drug we were talking about that kills 90 people a day? Huh? Fentanyl. Fentanyl. Are there any laws against that? Yes, there are. <laughs> By the way, in case you haven't heard, we've been fighting a war in this country called the War on Drugs for 50 years or longer. 50 years, though, at least. And there are more drugs in this country than there have ever been before. More drugs. So can you legislate morality? Can you pass laws and make people behave? Okay, well, the verdict, the verdict is in. All right, well, uh, let's talk about Alexander Graham Bell. Write this down. You know, the Gilded Age, we've talked about this a little bit before. There's, look, there she is with her Bible open and her hatchet. Uh that's the greatest. There were all sorts of inventions. There's Edison. He's the first, we've talked about this before. He's the first to record music on disc. There's an early day. They, they call that a gramophone. You put that record on there and you crank it up and then you, the thing would start spinning. You put the needle on it and you didn't have to have a band. To that. That, you know, that, that just seems to us like, what's the big deal? It was huge. It was huge. Uh, but Write this man down, A.G. Bell, Alexander Graham Bell. You know, uh, he's your hero, Alexander Graham Bell, because he invented the phone. How many phones, in 1876 or 77,
How many phone conversations do you think there have been since 1877? How many do you think there have been since this morning at eight o'clock when the first bell rang? It's worldwide, how many would you say? How much? Oh, I would be shocked if, I, if it were that few. Yeah, I don't know how many, but uh, that's the guy that started it all right there. And we'll talk about Alexander Graham Bell. And then, of course, the next guy we're going to talk about is Henry Ford, who did what? He invented the automobile, right? Hmm? No? He didn't invent it. That's what I heard. I could be wrong. Well, I could too, but I think you're right. We'll talk about that tomorrow. 